Hello, my name is Dave Ratt, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about EQing sound systems. Uh, if you're a sound man for a band, or you work in a club, maybe, I don't know, if you're dealing with any kind of um, uh, live reinforcement equipment, I'm um, sure you run into, you know, where do, where do you EQ, what do you EQ, and where do you EQ it? Uh, you've got several components in the sound system that we deal with. One, you've got microphones uh, on instruments, vocal mics, uh, DI boxes, and the various things coming from stage. They run into some sort of snaking system and eventually end up in a mixing board where we have control over it. Mixing boards have an EQ section for each channel um, with some sort of control there. Out of the mixing board, typically internally in a digital board or externally you have some sort of uh, outboard equalizer, maybe a graphic EQ, uh, EQ one-third octave. Maybe it's a uh, EQ inside of the board. After that, it goes to some other gear, and then uh, maybe there's a processor or some sort of um, module that plugs into the amp or something that uh, kind of came with the speaker system. Uh, maybe a preset for a processor that EQs the speaker system as well. So you've got basically three distinct places that you would uh, equalize a sound system. Uh, so where, where do you EQ what? You've got a mic, somebody's speaking to it, speaking into it on stage, and it doesn't sound how you want it to sound. Um, you know, what, which EQ do we go for? Do we go for the graph? Do we go for the system processor? Do we go for the channel EQ? Um, I have a pretty straightforward approach to this, and um, the theory is that the channel EQs are dedicated to fixing, repairing, equalizing the combination of the microphone and the instrument, or the microphone and the vocal. So if my voice sounds too boomy um, through this mic, um, we would reduce the low end on the channel, we'd EQ it on the channel. Um, if I go to a different mic and I sound too thin, uh, maybe we would, e we would EQ that on the channel. So the combination of my voice and the microphone would be, uh, or the instrument and the microphone would be repaired by EQing the channel. The speaker itself, the speakers that are in a box um, and the enclosure and the way that the speakers interact with each other, that is typically EQ'd by the system processor. Uh, it's generally now, uh, it's uh, supplied by the manufacturer of the speaker, they'll have some sort of preset uh, in the processor and that fixes the sound of the speaker enclosure combination and maybe they have presets for multiple enclosures working together. Finally, you have your outboard graph or your system EQ. Your system EQ, its job is to repair or to correct the speaker system to venue uh, combination. So theoretically, if you follow that uh, line of thinking out, if you use the same mics every day and you have the same band every day and they set up the same backline every day and use the same speakers every day, the only thing that would change from venue to venue would be your system EQ because you'd be correcting for a different venue. Uh, your channel EQs would stay the same because they're correcting for the instrument. If somebody, if the guitar player adds more low end to their guitar, you would correct for it here. If you have a boomy room, you can fix it on the, speaker, on the system EQ. And um, if there's some sort of peak in the speakers, it's done in the processor. Um, pretty, maybe pretty logical if you think of it that way. If you do, uh, follow that plan, if you do correct the various equalizations in that method, theoretically, this mic with somebody's voice or an instrument coming through it, corrected by the channel EQ, and all the channel EQs fix the mic slash instrument combinations, you should be able to hook up a recording system right at the left and right before the system EQ, make a recording, and play it back on any quality sound system and have it sound good. Have it sound similar to a studio balance or a, uh, it shouldn't be too bright, it shouldn't be too dull, it should sound correct because you've fixed that microphone instrument combination on the channel strips. Um, what the, one way to tell that or to determine that is get a good quality pair of headphones. And I did this Mighty Headphone Quest and some other videos uh, YouTube videos, and uh, these are Denon D2000s. These are my favorite of the bunch. Um, Cost-wise, probably the Shure SRH 840s. They were amazing. They're uh, about half the price of these. Um, 
And what those, the reason I did that head, uh, the Mighty Headphone Quest was specifically for this purpose, to EQ. Um, I carry these with me live everywhere I go, or a pair of 840s, and plug this into the headphone jack, put the headphones on, and EQ each of the microphone instrument combinations using the channel strips to sound correct in the headphones, in my reference. This acts as a common reference point that I bring with me everywhere. I always have the same reference point. And if I always make those instruments sound the same, regardless, or if there is a change, a different mic, a different guitar amp, if I make them sound correct here, and I plug this in and listen to CDs that I'm familiar with, and they sound correct, then my board tapes recorded off the left-right bus before the system EQ will sound correct. So now I've got this correct sound um, created off the channel EQs, and now I've taken, I'm taking this correct sound. Now the next way we gotta deal with it is now we have a system EQ to deal with. The system EQ, we play a CD that we're familiar with. We EQ the system so that CD sounds correct. We may use pink noise and we bring it to flat and that gets us closer, closer. You may use smart and uh, correct that so it's flat. Um, so now you've got some sort of way of uh, getting your system EQ so that correct music, correctly recorded CDs sound uh, proper through it, and you're EQing your microphone instrument combinations to sound correct. Then when you marry those two together and you've got your correct sound coming out of this into your correct sounding system, and assuming your speaker system has a processor or the actual yeah, system processors are EQ'd correctly, then the sound should come up sounding great. And then when you move to another room, you change your system EQ to correct for the room. Uh, variations. Uh, another good trick to get your uh, sound of the system EQ dialed in, you might use smart, use your various methods, is I use a comparative reference. I'll take a CD, I'll play it through the main system, I'll play it through the speakers, and I'll also plug my headphones right into the front of the CD player. And I'll put the headphones on and listen to the headphones, and I'll try and match, uh, match the volume. So the main system is about the same, size, same volume as the headphones. And I'll listen to the headphones, and I'll listen to the mains. And take them off and put them on. And I'll adjust the system EQ. If the headphones sound much brighter than the mains, and I know the headphones are correct, I'll dull the mains down. And you can, uh, as you become more familiar with it, you can actually get pretty good at it, where, you know, it's, you listen to the headphones, sh -sh 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 -sh, and you take it off, and you listen to the PA, you hear this, okay, that's a little bit too much, maybe 630, 800, or whatever, and you, you keep going back and forth until you've got a nice tonal match between your headphones, your constant reference point, and your system. And you've also used your headphones to get a good uh, sound off of your um, various instruments. If you've actually used your common reference point properly, you should be able to put those two together and have this correct sound pass completely through the system. Um, I found that this method is so effective for me that when I work in a recording truck, let's say I'm doing a live TV show, I can actually use my same EQ settings that I use for my live show on the recording truck console and get very close to the sounds that I'm looking for um, in a live festival. I'll do the same thing. I don't even need, I can actually check the entire band using my headphones and the familiar microphones. And then I'll play a CD in between bands, EQ the main PA using the CD and the headphones, make the main PA correct, check the channel inputs on the headphones, make that correct. Never hear the instruments through the main PA. And when I bring them both together, I can actually fire up the band and have them sound correct through the festival system without ever doing a full-blown line check or sound check with the band. Um, and you can get to that level. It takes some practice. And um, that's about it. There's, um, oh, oh, so a few more things. Um, okay, so also, what if you don't have a processor, a system processor to fix the speaker uh, enclosure sound? Um, well then, what your system EQ now does is it corrects the venue to speaker system EQ and also deals with the various abnormalities or anomalies within the speakers themselves. Again, 
the system EQ at that point, it's the same as if you don't do have a system processor. You're using the system EQ to fix the sound coming out of the speakers within that room. Uh, that combination is done by the system EQ with or without a processor. Um, another big thing is monitors. What about stage, uh, your monitor engineer? Now you're dealing with uh, a new dynamic where feedback, and feedback does affect front of house engineers as well. Um, uh, you're dealing with feedback where you have uh, to not only make the mic sound how it's supposed to sound, but also you have issues where it starts feeding back. The sound comes out of the speaker, gets back in the mic, regenerates, and causes various ring modes. Um, which EQ there? <coughs> which EQ there? Uh, the same thing applies. Uh, you're going to basically want to ring out the wedge, any kind of... Uh, you play music to the wedge, it doesn't really work. The, any abnormalities in the monitor system themselves should be corrected by the graph uh, or monitor processing EQ. And any tonal preferences that you want to achieve. Um, the person's got a boomy voice or you're using a mic that's very thin sounding, that would tend to be done on the channel EQ. Now one big mistake I see a lot of monitor engineers do is uh, over EQ. It's really tempting just to keep ringing out and ringing out and ringing out and think you're getting louder. Um, the reality is that once you cut three, four, five, you start to cut the sixth uh, dip on a third octave. Your third octave is 30 bands. 30 bands. You've cut six. You've cut 20%. You've got a handle on 20%. Each of those bands is not a narrow little thing. They're actually about three times wider than they look. 20%, um, you're cutting something that's three times wider uh, because when it dips a third octave, it's actually fairly wide. Um, third octave centering. Uh, 20% times 3, you're cutting 60% of the sound, 3 dB, or 2 dB, or 5 dB. It's 3 dB down at the center frequency, but it's also 2 dB down at the off the side frequencies. Um, so you start to cut six, six uh, of the faders on a third octave, and you're, you've cut 50% um, maybe of the sound coming through. You've cut uh, across the board 3 dB. Uh, you've got a couple, uh, half a dozen 6 dB cuts. So you really don't want to get beyond four or five or six graphs. You just really want to notch out a few uh, frequencies as far as ringing out on the, um, on the graph there. Uh, there are problems with really bad sounding monitors that do require more EQ. Theoretically, for that kind of stuff, um, you're kind of screwed now. Um, <clears throat> so for ringing out wedges, um, you want to find out a common pattern between the wedges. Anything that's common between the wedges, um, all the wedges are bright, all the wedges are dull. No matter what instrument you run into them, there's too much 2K. That's something you're going to go to the graphs for um, and your monitor EQs. Uh, you've got a microphone and it feeds back at 2K, but the guitar sounds great in there. Then you're going to want to dive into your channel EQs to fix that first. Um, so you're, for your vocal mics, start with your channel EQs to get rid of vocal specific things. And it's kind of a back and forth process. You run the guitars in, you run the bass in, you run some instruments in, you check the sound of the monitors, you get an idea of what their issues are. You go in and EQ those monitors, you get a, a rough EQ on the graphs um, to get the monitors closer to what they should be sounding like. Then you bring in the vocal mics and do some channel EQing to get those a bit closer to correct for the vocal mics. And then as you bring it up, you might have to go back to the graphs and start cutting a little bit more. Uh, you really want to avoid on the graphs, on any graph EQ, cutting too many frequencies. There's a lot of interference between those various bands. Anything that you can do on um, cut and sweep EQs, parametric type EQs like the consoles have, um, is uh, definitely preferable sound and feedback wise. All right, uh, that should cover it for now. And I'll try and do more videos soon. Awesome. So thank you for hanging out, and I hope you found this video and others that I do interesting and informative. And check out soundtools.com. Take a look at the products that I personally designed, some solutions for the pro audio industry, uh, analog over Cat5, a bunch of testers, um, and other useful tools. Um, ratsound.com has got our sales department, rental department, install department, uh, we sell a wide variety of pro audio and AV gear. We do installations, small to large, and we do rentals for 
everything as small as local clubs and backyard parties all the way up to Coachella Festival and artists like Pearl Jam, Jack Johnson, Blink-182. And thanks for hanging out.